This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. Well, my guest today, Dana Griffith, is a very much in-demand actor of breathtaking range and depth. Born and raised in Fairfield, Ohio, Dana moved to Pittsburgh to attend Point Park University from where we're recording this episode of StoryBeat. After graduating, she established working relationships with every professional theater company in Steeltown. Dana has performed in over 55 productions with Pittsburgh's greatest theater institutions, such as the Pittsburgh Public Theater, Off the Wall, City Theater, Front Porch Theatricals, Picked Classic Theater, and Bare Bones. In 2013, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette named her Performer of the Year. In 2015, she was nominated for the Carol R. Brown Emerging Artist Award. From May to September of 2018, she was seen on stage at City Theater in Sean Daniels' The White Ship, Lauren Gunderson's The Revolutionists, Ragtime at, at Lincoln Park Performing Arts Center, and Front Porch Theatrical's sold-out production of Grey Gardens. Dana's film credits include Richard Linklater's upcoming Where'd You Go, Bernadette, starring Kate Blanchett and Kristen Wiig, Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Rises, Anna Martimucci's Holidaysburg, Pittsburgh Dad's Streetlight Stories, starring as Deb, his usually invisible wife, and she'll uh, soon start resume filming on Unsinkable, where she plays the Countess of Rothis, a passenger on the Titanic. Dana's TV credits include Guiding Light, a recurring role in WGN's Outsiders, multiple pilots, web series roles, and national and local commercials. Dana also runs Griffith Coaching, where she coaches actors of all ages to prepare them for auditions and to help them discover the joys of acting. For more information, please uh, check out www.danamichellegriffith.com. For the record, I had the great good fortune to work with Dana on Picked Classic Theater's sterling 2015 production of Jacques Brel is Alive and Well and Living in Paris. So for me, this is a true honor and pleasure to welcome the great Dana Griffith to Story Be Today. <laughs> Dana, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Well, it's really grand to have you here. <laughs> Tell us a bit about your history. I mean, you've been at this acting game for, for a little bit of time now, but at what age did the bug first bite you? Um, I actually didn't start performing um, in plays until I was uh, in my latter years of high school. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't grow up doing this. Um, I had I was in show choir. I was in chorus, but I was pretty athletic um, growing up. I played tennis, uh, did gymnastics. I was a cheerleader. That those kinds of things, mm -hmm. and um, and I I got into it pretty late um but it the bug bit me um very early uh little shop of horrors was one of my favorite tv shows or was one of my favorite movies and rags to riches was one of my favorite tv shows they were musical they were set in the 60s they were fun and um and i would just I knew every word. I knew everything. Um, so I, I wasn't like a, I wasn't loving musicals when I was little, but I was definitely um, around music a lot. Were you an in the mirror performer as a kid? Uh, yeah, I was because I'm an only child, so I played pretend a ton, and there was a mirror um, uh, that was in our in our house that I. I liked to pretend in front of, and mm -hmm. I would actually envision myself in like makeup and hair. And I remember I was thinking about this the other day, like it looked real to me. None of that stuff was on me, but I was able to like look in this mirror and imagine eyeshadow and imagine, and I could see it. It was very bizarre. But as a child, my imagination, because I was an only child, was 
huge. And and clearly you've been able to fulfill a lot of that. Do you still have those visions when you're looking at yourself in the mirror? Um, not necessarily that clear, but, but I do, um, for each role I play, I have this idea. I get this idea. I see myself as mm -hmm. whatever that thing is. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we'll have grand conversations with the hair and makeup people um, to, to not necessarily like in movies and film, but like um, in on stage, I'll say, you know, I see this, like I, I just finished revolutionist at city theater and she was a writer and um, I could just, I saw her hands just covered in ink and the costume designer was a little terrified of this because that means there's ink on my hands in her gorgeous costumes. Mm -hmm. And so I took it upon myself to find something um, that would work, that would not stain anything else because I had to have these dirty hands I because ink would have been all over her and, hands. And, and the costume designer didn't allow that to be part of the costume then, where they, there was ink on the costume as well. Exactly. Yeah, she wanted to keep it nice and clean, which makes total sense because they were built for me and they were gorgeous. They, all the costumes were amazing. But um, but she was like, yeah, I dig that idea. Find something that doesn't come off your fingers. Are, are you the type of actor who uh, y you come to life more once you've got the costume and makeup on? Um, I don't I don't know if that if I would go that far. I I I have a I have a, a pretty clear um, beginning vision when I read the play um, and when I'm auditioning for a play of what I see it, mm -hmm. um, how I see it, which um, might work to my benefit when I audition for things mm -hmm. because then I come in with something very clear. It's not muddied. It's um, it's how I envision it to be. And as we go on, as we rehearse, um, it becomes clearer and clearer. It gets in my muscles. That's the thing that I, I find um, rehearsals are so amazing for is that we get to figure out how this person stands, how this person reacts to people, and what that means in their muscles. And it, I take it that, that that comes from your very first reading of the text. Yeah. So how many plays have you done where you've done something with that play before? Any of them? Um, like you, you've done twi two different productions of the same play. Yeah, I've done um, I've done Cabaret the musical three times. Mm. I've done uh, Death of a Salesman twice. Um, I've done Oliver the musical twice. And is that it? I think that's it. So, do you feel like each one of those productions that were different? Do you approach them differently, or did you come at them the same way? Um, I did approach them differently. It's funny when you do things multiple times at different times in your life; um, they change, they evolve, and you evolve. You evolve. Yeah, and so you um, mature. You have life impacts you in some other way. Yeah, totally. So, cabaret was at three very different times in my life and always Sally Bowles um no uh twice um what well, once I was a Kit Kat girl okay. and uh Sally Bowles understudy and then uh the the other time was at Point Park in 2000 and I don't know three two something like that um and that was Sally Bowles and uh and then the other was Kit Kat girl mm. so um it is it's funny it's funny to like just the brass in that musical to go back to it a couple of years after playing Sally and and having that that kind of reaction to the music and where our country was at that time it's just so interesting well, so they're all a little different well that play has political resonance as yeah. well and it, and if you come out and you're playing it in a certain time and era you're it's going to have a different resonance to it yeah totally um, and that's a very clever part of what Christopher Isherwood did in the original I am camera yeah to that could then got translated into a musical um do you feel that acting is a calling for you is it I do. I totally do. It sounds so cliche, but it's like well, but it's it, totally true. If it is, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I um I always have. I I mean since I was little. Um but I thought that um being an actor 
I didn't realize being an actor meant you had to, I mean, why would I know this? But I didn't realize you had to train and you had to move to a place where acting happens. I thought it was going to be a job like my dad going to the factory every night to build cars. I thought I would go down the street and I would make TV shows. Two blocks away there totally. people people acted. Yeah, past that farm, <laughs> there's a place where you make TV shows and movies. And I legitimately thought that. Well, in Los Angeles, that's true. Yes, <laughs> but in Fairfield, Ohio, no, not, not so, so much. much. Exactly. Or in Pittsburgh, for that matter. <laughs> exactly. In Fairfield, it's like past that farm, you're in Indiana, so yay for you. Um, but yeah, so I, I did, I knew I wanted to do it, but I kind of thought I would be an art teacher, um, uh, that I, because I, I was very much, that was my creative outlet, mm-hmm. was painting and pottery and um, ceramics. And I really thought that's what I was going to do because I didn't know how to get into this. Are you still painting and doing pottery um, and ceramics? Yeah. Um, uh, the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts um, is um, um, uh, has a great pottery studio there. And um, I just paint at my house. My house is filled with my paintings. <laughs> <laughs> how, Nobody else has. I mean, my mom has one. How does uh, okay? I, I love I love this because I love when people are artists. They tend to do more than one art, one uh, kind of art, yeah. one more than one discipline. I should say. How does your painting, your ceramics, and so on? How does that impact your acting? Um, it's interesting because I feel like the my painting, especially when I got back from New York, uh, when I moved back to Pittsburgh from New York City, um, I was painting all the time. Uh, because I was sad. I was, um, I, I didn't know what was happening in my life. I, and it was, it, it seems to come into play. Uh, and same with the pottery. That's when I started going to Center for the Arts because I needed to use my hands. Mm-hmm. I needed to do something that was creative, that wasn't coming out of my face and my mouth and my diaphragm. I needed to not create a person. I needed to create something beautiful and it wasn't all about you yeah because actors it's all about you you're the instrument you're the 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 mechanism through which we get this thing called acting uh, but but pottery you make it but then it sits there on its own yeah exactly right? painting uh, same thing and so so you can when you came back from New York did you feel a sense of displacement I did um because I I felt like I was I was failing somehow what, what years was it where did you go to new york um i came back in i came back at the very end of um 2007 mm-hmm. um and so you'd only been there a few years yeah i had only been there a handful of years i knew i didn't like it from week one um it was it's too much hurly burly too much hurly burly and we lived initially we lived um near turtle bay mm-hmm. um on the east side and then we moved um to hell's kitchen and we were on 49th between 9th and 10th. And and you, I assume you were out auditioning all the time. That Constantly. And I loved the auditioning. That was the best part of the day. Because mm-hmm. you got to be somebody else for two minutes. Sure. Uh, and, and my assumption is, is it didn't turn into the big thing you'd hoped it turn into. And that's why you came back. Yeah, kind of. Not really, though, because I was really, I know that if I would have stuck it out, I was getting Broadway callbacks. Mm -hmm. It was, I always called it, I wanted to make my autobiography, Me and the Girl That Got It, because my time (laughs) in New York, it was legitimately me and the girl that got the Broadway contract. (laughs) And it always came down to the two of us. And it was fascinating. And I would watch them in their callbacks, you know, I I would be at Telsey and I, I there were window you know, windows in the doors and I could see them in there and hear them and wonder like what's different? Well, I didn't have Point Park did not have um a, at the time, a showcase. We mm-hmm. were the last class to not have a showcase. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and we begged for one. Um, Marcus Stevens was in my class. There's mm. a bunch of people that um, then moved to New York who were like, okay, let's get this started. And I got myself an agent, and I, I, I did the whole thing. Um, but I loved the auditioning. Um, the reason I left was really because my life... Um, and I was leaving, I was meeting lots of people and I was leaving and going to do shows and then I would come back and my life was, was only about making myself something else for someone. Every audition I felt so amazing and then I would leave and, and I would think like, 
you know, I better go to the gym. I better go and do this. And I, I, I better I better walk there because, you know, that will be extra movement for me. And that will and it just became this like obsession with being perfect for the people in the room. Whatever that means. Exactly. Whatever that means. Because I am also a perfectionist and I understand what you're talking about where it's got to be just exactly right. Yes. Whatever that means. Yeah. Because so for other dance people calls, it means something else. Totally. So I was going to all these dance calls and it was like I had to have the perfect outfit and I had to have the perfect dress and the perfect Laduca dance shoes. And I, I mean, it was, I was obsessed with it mm -hmm. and I was getting places. Um, well, I've got to tell you, it's hard for me to imagine you weren't because you, <laughs> Thanks. you have just unbelievable amounts of talent. Oh, so. thank you. It was pretty, it was exciting. Um, but then I kind of realized, like, I just want to be an actor. Wherever that is. And I was coming back to Pittsburgh once a year to do a show at, like, at the public. And I thought, like, I'm definitely not going back to Fairfield because I have no <laughs> no need to be there. But I could go back to Pittsburgh. I already had these the, the, relationships. The cows were not calling to you. No. <laughs> they weren't. Thank God. Um, <laughs> and Pittsburgh has a spectacular amount of um, activity here theatrically. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and with all the movies, you know, movies had started filming here. And I thought, well, you know, let's let's try. And um, and it worked in my benefit. Well, good, good move on your part. <laughs> yeah. And I think not just good for you, but good for us. That's, that's the real, oh, the real that's key. So, nice. uh, um, so obviously you've done a bunch of stuff. And at what point did you think to yourself, Hey, I am actually pretty good at this. I, I do understand what I'm doing. Or has it never hit you? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that really hasn't happened yet. But I am, um, I do find that I am, uh, I am much more confident than I was 10 years ago. You know when you go up for a part and you get a part, you're going to be able to do it. Yes. There isn't a question in your head that, I don't think I can do this. No, you actually know you can do it. Yeah. The question is, is how well and in what way. Right. Right? Yeah. And, and how much is it going to take out of me? I, I think it's a very uh, good thing for our audience to, to hear someone like you say that you don't think you've quite gotten there yet because that is what makes you keep going after it. Otherwise, why bother? Exactly. A lot of my students will say, I need to get rid of my nervousness. I have such stage fright, and I get so nervous when I audition, and I say, oh, no, 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 no. If you get rid of that, that means you don't care anymore. I'm nervous every time I walk into an audition. Are you? Oh, absolutely. To this day, do you get nervous before a show? Um, the first show, yes. After that, no. How do you handle it? Um, a lot of uh, deep breathing and trying to focus. I'm I am a a firm believer in um, in uh, focusing my energy as much as possible as the character. Mm -hmm. So Dana is out of the picture for the first like ten minutes of that of that first play in front of an audience. So you, you really have to be deeply into the character to get to that point. Oh yeah, and then there's some plays like Grey Gardens, um, that play. It was from beginning to end, I, I don't think I thought my own thought, um, thought a, a, a thought of my own, um, because I just had to be fully committed. Well, you, I, I mean, because I've seen a lot of things you've written online, uh, and I know that Little Edie was a big deal for you, mm -hmm. and you had been studying her for a very long time. Yeah, not even realizing, but yes, I was. You were you were you were deeply into that kind of thinking or that character before you got there. Yeah. So it was ful I assume pretty much a fulfillment for you to do that. Oh yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I got to see it. It was <laughs> It was pretty awesome to see <laughs> do that part. Um, uh, so uh, clearly of late, you've been unbelievably busy. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you've been going from one gig to another to another to another. Um, now, obviously, that's a challenge. Let, let's explore that a minute. What is it like to be in a show, having another one that you're working on at the same time, and have a repetition of that from one show to the next? How do you handle that? Um, it's really hard. It's been... The last 10 years, since I've returned from New York, I've done 55 shows. That's a lot of shows. That's a lot of That's shows. five shows a year. At least. And there were some years that I did seven. Um, uh, the year I won Performer of the Year, I did seven shows. How do you, I mean, what, in your mind, how do you manage it? Um, I'm, I, 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 
I don't know if I do it very well. I become. You do it extremely. Oh, well. you're very, you're very <laughs> sweet. Um, I have a, um, I can't do things, anything in my life. I don't do it halfway. My agents is always like, you give two hundred percent in everything that you do. Good, good for you. Yeah, and I do, and I think it's because I've, I wanted to do this so badly growing up, and then when I actually started getting cast, I was like, oh my god. I can't wait to do it again. I can't wait to do it. And every time I would get cast in something new, I'd think, oh, and I still do this. I'm like, yes, I get to do it again. And I just throw everything into it. Well, you certainly must know there are plenty of actors in the world who don't get to do that. Yes. And you're very fortunate in the sense that totally. you get to do it over and over again like that. Absolutely. So you just take advantage of it every time. Yeah, I just, I, I love it every single time. Um, I do get to points where, and I'm at one of those points right now, um, where I take a break mm -hmm. and I step back. Um, it The last time it happened was in... Uh, uh, the end of 2014, and then it happened again at the end of 2016, and that was after um, just doing things back to back to back to back, because this year I've had two weeks off um, since the first week of January, and in those two weeks I went to um, Florida, and then I went to Maine with my husband, and every other week of this year I've been either rehearsing in a theater or performing in a theater, mm -hmm. sometimes overlapping and doing both at the same time. Um, and so... You ever get the lines mixed up? Um, I don't. I never have. Thank God. <laughs> I need to knock on something. <laughs> um, I have not. Um, but I I push myself and then I crash um, when it comes to theater. And, but um, the theater also lifts you up. The audience lifts you up. Oh, yes. I mean, rehearsing and being on stage is... The most thrilling thing in the absolute in the entire world. It's oxygen to you. Oh, absolutely. It's the time away from that when I'm like trying to gather my energy and um, and relax that I feel the the weight of it, the the how much it takes out of me, mm -hmm. and having to all day. You're like you're sprinting all day long. And then you have this performance at 8 p.m. So you're going to start running the race at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. But I've gotten up at 6.30. Uh -huh. So it's like how do you – and figuring out when your meals are and all – you know, it's really – it's fascinating and it's exciting when you get in that repetition. But then um, at the end of it, I'm like – I need to not. I need to be me for five seconds. So more or less, since you've been back to Pittsburgh, there hasn't been a, a great long period of you for you in which I don't have a gig and I don't know where one's coming. Yeah, that's really fortunate. Yes, and it's absolutely. also it's also a testament to something else, right? Like sure. to, your, to your abilities. Um, so I, I guess the question I'm going to ask you, maybe you don't have a good answer for, which mm -hmm. is how do you manage the downtime? Well, you don't have a lot of it. I don't have a lot of it. So you and you already know. I'm guessing you already know you're booked out in advance to a certain extent? Um, I usually do. Um, at this point, after um, this year has been a very special year. They're all very special. But this year has been super special uh -huh. um, because of Grey Gardens um, and because of um, Revolutionists and because of Ragtime and uh, Devil Inside with the, the rep with the Playhouse. Um, it's just been every role that I have played this year has been... Um, epic and um and i've gone one right into the next at city theater in the white chip i played 17 characters oh my goodness. in an hour and 15 minutes i was male i was female i was young i was old and i never left the stage and um so this year i'm has been so crazy fulfilling mm -hmm. and um and i'm i'm satisfied i am very full artistically and I'm just going to step back. I have not, I'm not auditioning for anything. Film and TV, I am auditioning for um, because that is a super challenge and I love a challenge. You find that film and TV is more of a challenge than stage? Yeah. Why? Um, because there's, there's, um, there's so many people to, um, watching you that you can disappoint if you screw up and they have to go back to one and uh, there's just a lot of pressure and um and the continuity having because i am i am a creature of my environment so whatever is on stage that night um 
that's what I'm reacting to. Mm -hmm. And it's never the same. You're an of the moment actor for sure. Big time. So having to not be that and be in the moment but make it the same and have that continuity. With the same hand motions, the same head turn and all the rest of it. It's so hard and I love it. I think it's fascinating. Um, So so yeah, so I'm going to audition for um, film and TV things and of course shoot Unsinkable um, and teach kids how to do what I do. So, uh, so, all right, let's talk about auditioning for a, a brief moment. Yeah. What, what is your philosophy? How do you approach auditioning? Um, I am, I approach it in, um, I like to, I like to be myself. I am, um, I, I don't like bringing into the room someone that they're not going to then rehearse with the entire time or film with the entire time. And uh, Nancy Mosser, who runs Nancy Mosser Casting, Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, she asked me to teach an audition class for her, which I do um, when I have the time. And I haven't had much time this year, but I have taught it once this year. Um, But she said, nobody auditions like you. Can you please teach people to audition like you? And I thought, that is such a great compliment because I was, you know, in my mid-30s and still figuring, we're always still figuring it out. Sure. And I thought, what is different? How am I different? And I have sat in a lot of auditions and um, and I see that I I bring, I think that I bring an ease to the audition room, that my energy is not jumping out of my skin so your nerves don't show no i don't think they show at all um they used to for sure but i I think meditation and yoga and all of those things and just kind of being a chill person in general um works in my benefit i would think it does yeah i mean for sure in well we all know that uh folks that work in front of the camera it's all about how deeply you can relax in front of the camera totally and without that ability, it shows like a you know you're you're in close. It's you're looking at the skin. Yeah. So uh, so the fact that you don't show your nerves, even though you've already told us that you have them, <laughs> yeah. can you can you tell us how is it just deep breathing? Um. No, but I. Th- is there I, a mental process you go through? I think so. I think, I think it goes back to, um, me when I was growing up. I was really able to, I mean, even my dentist says this. My dentist is like, you are so, you go someplace else. And I legitimately do. I can, I can really put myself in a completely different place. And even my husband will say, where'd you just go? Because I will, I just go. And it's because I was by myself. (laughs) All the time growing up, except with my parents. So you have a very rich and vivid oh, yeah. uh, imaginary life of sorts. Oh, yes. A- and by the way, auditioning is clearly not like pulling teeth for you, yeah. according to your dentist. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> very true. <laughs> um, how do you learn lines? You've learned a lot of lines in your career <laughs> till now, and I assume you're going to learn a lot more. <laughs> what is your line learning process? Um, I actually, uh, I was, I was told by, um, Sharon Brady from Point Park, um, a a handful of years ago, we did a show together where she played my mother and I had monologue after monologue after monologue in this play. And I had come in with like 60% of the monologues completely memorized. And I was having trouble with the last couple of pieces. And she told me that, uh, at Juilliard, they teach them to, and this is what I teach all my kids, to start at the bottom and work their way up. What do you mean at the bottom of the page? The bottom of the monologue. The bottom of the monologue and work your way backwards. Work your way backwards. So you, you take the, and this, I, you know, people pay for my coachings for me to tell you this. So now it's, it's out there for <laughs> yeah, everyone. Yeah, but not everybody's <laughs> going to hear this show, trust me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but so they, um, you start with the last line, and let's say the last line was, and that's the day I left. So you would say that line with no inflection, and you would say it three times in a row, and that's the day I left, and that's the day I left, and that's the day I left. Then you add the next one on and say it was um, Tuesday was the first day of my life. Tuesday was the first day of my life, and that's the day I left. Tuesday was the first day of my life, and that's the day I left. And you do it three times. Mm. It's, it's tedious, but you always know what's coming next. 
you always know what's next because you have learned it in this kind of monotone and this is what works for me uninflection uninflection so then you are totally free because you'll always know what the words are well that's david mamet's big point about acting is to it must be the lines must be spoken in an uninflected manner mm, mm, that's boring but yes but not, not <laughs> yeah. when you're performing right when you're when, when you're, you're learning, learning it. yes totally um and that is uh I, i'll do like you know five or six a night right before i go to bed and then the next day I pack on another five or six, and then the next day I pack on another five or six, and pretty soon I have the whole monologue, and I'm good to go. Do you do that with the whole play? Do you start at the end? No, I just do it with with with, with long di- long chunks. Yeah, with long chunks, um, with chunks that are more than like five sentences. Um, with dialogue, it's tricky with dialogue and me because I go through the script and I find the trigger word. Um, whatever the trigger would be. Describe what a trigger word is for the audience. A trigger word is the thing in your sentence that, in the sentence before when you speak, that makes you think of what you're saying next. Mm -hmm. Not you, the actor, but you, the character, and why that triggers your character to, um, to respond the way that they do. Does it tick you off? Does it make you jealous? Does it make you fall in love? Whatever it is, so that there's, you know, um, so it's spontaneous, Mm -hmm. like how we speak. Mm -hmm. Um, This can, as I've gotten older, this is, um, it's tricky because I will go through and find the trigger words and I will legitimately not know what's coming next. Mm. And when I was in my 20s, I, I knew every single thing. I knew, I knew exactly what was coming next. I could go through the dialogue and not hear the other person, you know, just be in my dressing room kind of like spitting my lines out. As I've gotten older and done this more, I will not know what's coming next. Even though it's in your head. Oh, yeah. I know the line. But like somebody, you know, the... the, the um, during Revolutionists, uh, the stage manager said, when you say X, Y, and Z, and I was literally like, when do I say that? I mean, I'm, I'm serious because I am, it is, I've made this thing, I've made it so spontaneous, and that is a, a good and a bad thing. For the actor, it's terrifying. For the audience, it's exciting. Mm-hmm. So, um, For sure. Yeah. So it is legitimately me responding in the moment, every single time. So I, I teach acting directing for writers mm-hmm. in, at, in the program here, and one of the things that I teach is that you know it's you've got to be in the moment, and that we want the performance to come out as if it's just happening spontaneously, just what you're talking about. But it's really hard for actors to get there, yeah, because it's because once you're on stage, you're already one step removed from reality, mm-hmm. and it is canned in a certain sense because you're it is memorized lines it is memorized blocking and staging and so for a human to then repeat that over and over again and make it seem fresh is really hard so yeah. i think what you're talking about technique wise is phenomenal mm-hmm. i'm not sure everybody can do what you're talking about yeah it's um i i, hope, I don't know I, I hope more can than not but it, that seems like it's really an interesting challenge to give yourself yeah and it's it does when i when i first felt myself doing it it was, um, it felt like freedom. I mean, it really, I love the idea of the fourth wall being missing and and people snooping in. And I love theater that, that feels like that when I go and I see a show and I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm totally snooping and that's so exciting. Um, and I just, I got in my head um, many years ago that I just wanted it to be so um, alive and, and present and... Um, and that has that has created what my performances have become. Mm-hmm. I, I and it's been for years that I mean I think the the first one that I really felt that was Blythe Spirit, and that was in 2014. And pretty much everything since then, um, you could say a line to me, and I would have no idea if 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 I was out of the scene, I would have no idea what my response would That's be. That's very interesting. It's so weird. So so how would in a rehearsal process, how would you then pick it back up? You somebody have to prompt you. Yeah, you'd have to get prompted. And I and I do. And I, I would say I would say do it all the time and say, okay, what do I say next? And they would t- and then I would be able to get back into the cycle. 
That is, I think that's fascinating. It's crazy and it's terrifying. <laughs> but it's wonderful because it's so free on stage. And I get off stage and I leave the theater and I'm like, yes. It has, it's never failed you. No. You've always been able to let that, it's always come out the right way. Yeah. I mean, there might be a, a word or two that's, you know, I say that instead of this or something like that, but, but. But it doesn't cause you to go completely off book somewhere. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, I think that's fascinating. Um, you have a capacity for both comedy and drama, as well as musicals, which which you excel at. Mm. Um, is there one flavor that you prefer over the other? <laughs> that's adorable. Um, no, I like it all. I'll do, like this year I do, did two musicals. Um, I've not done two musicals in one year since a very long time. Um, when I got out of school at Point Park, I only did musicals. And I was always called back for the plays, but I never got cast in them. I was always cast in the musicals. So when I got out of school, I was bound and determined to be taken seriously as an actress and not as a musical theater performer. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I would do a monologue from Salome where I was talking to, you know, uh, his head on a platter and <laughs> do because I really <laughs> wanted somebody to be like, she's a great actress. And luckily... Um, I got lucky and did a couple of plays here in town at the public and city theater and stuff. And uh, and so I'll do like a series of plays now and then I'm like, oh, I need to sing. And then I'll sing and I'll be done with a musical and I'm like, I can only do plays. <laughs> I mean, it's literally like back and forth constantly. So, so in other words, one is like a palate cleanser for you. Oh, yeah, Totally. Absolutely. So the next one cleans it out. Uh -huh. So if you went back to back to back on musicals, have you ever done a super long run, like a year or more? No. No. So so that experience would be a unique one to you if you somebody cast you in something and you were on, on, the, on the road, say, for instance, you right. got a huge part on the road. Yeah. That would be a unique experience for you. Yes. Yeah. I think in the, in the sense of doing it, if I was doing something on the road, um, that would be exciting because the... Um, the scenery would change, mm -hmm. the job would stay the same, but we would be in different places and that would be exciting. And so I wouldn't feel like I was um, um, settling or, or being rooted or something. But if I was here doing something a long time, living in my house, um, I don't think I'd be able to do that. Well, the good news is on that is that it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. No. Exactly. There's no such thing. Uh, not in, not in this city anyway. Yeah. You know, uh, occasionally you see it in the bigger cities, certainly in New York. But mm -hmm. uh, um, can you think of what the most challenging experience you've ever had, the most difficult experience you've had, and how you handled it? In the theater? In the Or in movies or TV. What, what was something that was like, holy mackerel, how am I going to handle this? Mm. And how did you handle it? Mm-hmm. Um, I think hmm, that's a tough one. I, I, I think that there's a, there's a couple instances, um, uh, that come to mind. Um, and Grey Gardens is one of them. Uh, I had, I had not been so excited and terrified to play someone in my life. Um, it was deeply emotional for you. Oh Yeah. And, I mean, I started watching that documentary when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really scared that I was going to mess it up and that the diehards like myself that are total fangirls would, um, would not accept it and not because of X, Y, and Z, because I'm, I'm not the same age as little Edie. I'm not the same size as little Edie. Like, just things that were, like, out of my control. Um, and so I was terrified. And I went back and forth after I was cast um, with the director saying, are you sure? Are you sure? Because I'm, I'm so excited and I'm also terrified for the first time in I mean, a very long time mm -hmm. um, because I didn't want to screw it up. Mm -hmm. And um, so that would probably be it was it was the biggest challenge because I didn't want to mess up. And I I had this idea. And then it, it through rehearsals, it started, like I said, with the whole getting in your muscles. Um, it just started happening. And my, I would be home, and I would say something to Dan, and he would say, okay, Edie, because it would be in the same, because it was happening all the time. And I wasn't watching the film, um, but it was all this, it was just, 
It was fascinating. Um, and it was every night before doing the show, um, I was really scared because I just thought if I, you know, if I do something that's not, that's not truthful, that's not Edie's truth, mm-hmm. some diehard is going to find it and see it and know it a mile away. A civilian out there that loves Grey Gardens. And what did you think that they would do to you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that they would run on stage, grab you and kidnap no. you and drag you away and say, how dare you do this to little Edie? <laughs> uh, no, but I think I wanted, if, if, if I was the, when I saw it on Broadway, it was like, it was like seeing, I mean, it was so exciting to see it come to life. And she's singing, you know, like, <laughs> that's amazing. And so seeing it in New York at 25 years old or whatever I was, was so cool because I I got to be live in the room with little Edie. So what was the solution to this great big, other than the ultimate result being you f- did the show, mm-hmm. um, during the process where you had to pull your way through was it this day-to-day you solved this challenge by day-to-day just keep banging away at it yeah I mean it when I would get home um it's all consuming when I'm in a show but it, it and it never I never turn it off I get home and I'm still working I'm working and I'm working and I'm working and my husband's always like it's midnight stop and I just don't um do you dream it uh, oh yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I wake up with the words. I mean, it's I, and I don't sleep very well when I'm in shows because mm-hmm. um, it just it's all consuming, which is exciting and and hard and exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like crazy exhausting. Um, but I, I would, um, it I would get home after rehearsal and it would just be this constant thing. And I would think of her and I would think of her face and I would think of how she would stand and saying these things and it just it got in it 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 found its way into me and um and so then I wasn't because I was afraid I was going to be pissed at myself Mm -hmm. on stage that I would feel like something wasn't truthful did you feel like you were being a fraud yes I if if I wasn't being completely um her if I wasn't having her, her thoughts only And I do it at, like, of course I was going to do it. If there's a theme that runs through a lot of Story Beat episodes, it has to do with artists who think that everyone's going to figure out they're a fraud. They're a fraud. Totally. (laughs) That's totally true. It is really is true. Most artists think, well, they're going to figure me out in a minute. Yeah. And then when they do, I'm going to be put into artist jail and I'm never getting out. (laughs) Yeah. Right? That's hysterical. Yeah. That's absolutely a problem. Yeah. Um, Okay. So the, so the, the then... I think I got the answer to the question, which is to overcome the challenge was just to keep doing the work. Yes. And it, feel like I was being honest. And feel like you're being honest. As her. So so it requires honesty to feel like you're being honest. Yeah. Yeah. You totally. Can't, you can't dishonestly feel honest. Exactly. I, Dana, have to feel honest in the skin of little Edie, mm-hmm. in her honesty, and mm-hmm. what her truth is. Yeah. That's that's great. So let's talk about directors for a moment. Mm-hmm. You've worked with many different directors, mm-hmm. some multiple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of them are uh, are not famous directors, but you've also worked with some spectacularly famous directors, mm-hmm. especially in movies. Yeah. Um, what do you want from a director? What do you what What are you looking for? Um, that's an interesting question because, um, like actors, directors have their own each have their own thing, their own way about getting what they want from you. And it's, um, and I respect and love the fact that it's always different. Um, I love being told, start walking on your right foot and end on this sentence here. You do, you like being that specific. But I also love being told, just go. Right. I love it all. Um, Because it, it, it means that they trust me enough to know that I will start on my right foot every single time mm-hmm. and end in this place and do exactly what they want. It's like they choreograph the show. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do that. I also love being told, just try something. Uh, do whatever you want. See what happens. Um, I've I've done equally both, um, and I love both. When I was younger, I did not like the um, just try it. Figure out what comes out because I didn't trust myself. Um, but 
after doing it and doing it and doing it, I was like, oh, I totally know what I'm doing. So there are, you know, infinite flavors of actors and there are infinite flavors of directors. Totally. And 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 sometimes it meshes well and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, would you say that uh, you like directors to give you line readings? I would think not. No, and I never really have had a director that's given me line readings. Mm. Um, there was a director once that said, not to me, um, this was years ago, told an actor to change their face, <laughs> which was hysterical. <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, what the crap does you, that mean? You go over to the prop property <laughs> department and you yeah. get a new face. I, I need a new face, please. Yeah. <laughs> but And I was like, is, does that mean, like, their emotional value of what they're saying? Like, did the, I, I'm, And he didn't elaborate. And she was like, okay. Like, what's that is mean? she's still working or she's she been she screwed up not. for life? She she's been not. She's screwed up for life <laughs> by that one comment. She's not in the business Change anymore. Change your face. <laughs> and she's beautiful. So it's it was really, it was him not being able to articulate what he wanted. So All right, so let's talk about movies and TV for a minute, which is a kind of a different beast, right? Totally. I mean, you're still acting, you're still memorizing lines, you're still putting you in costume and makeup, and there's lights and all the rest of it, but they're coming in and they're really up in your grill, so <laughs> yes, to speak. Yes, yes. Uh, how do you, uh, obviously there's a different technique to acting for film and TV than there is for stage. Yeah. And how do you think your way through that? You have to bring it way down for movies and TV, don't you? Yeah. Um, uh, it is, it's much smaller. I always think um, when I go into it, audition. Intimate is the word. Intimate, yes, intimate. Um, uh, when auditioning or uh, filming, um, I often think, Whatever the the feeling, whatever the emotional value of um, the particular scene or sentence or statement, um, if you feel it in your gut, um, it will show on your face. If you just feel happiness, the happiness will show. Mm -hmm. um, and you're not showing happiness like on stage of like, look at me, I have a big smile, see how happy I am so that the people in the back of the theater can see it. It's literally because it has to be so intimate. Um, if you think happiness, if you think the, the emotional value, it will come out. It takes a lot of trust in yourself and knowing that it's there. Um, and I did a lot of practice um, in the last 10 years in front of my computer where I would have my computer here set up looking at me and I would be doing my scenes that I would, you know, then go and audition with or then go and, and shoot and um, and try to catch the, the fraud, try to catch the moment where it was too much. Mm -hmm. or um, And I've never been told on set to pull back. Um, and I have been told... Uh, to I, I love improving, um, and it's terrifying in front of a camera. But during Holidaysburg, there was a lot of improv because it's going to live somewhere forever. Oh, it's going to be somewhere, and <laughs> and it was terrifying having all those people watch, and it was a comedy. Um, so it is. It's very much kind of just in my opinion, feeling it and not showing it. Because it's going to come out if you're thinking so it. So both for stage and uh, for camera, uh, it's an internal process, a psychological process, but one is going to come out distinctly different than the other. Yes. And you have, you're in, you're in charge of that, and you have to regulate it. Yes. And so that requires a lot of self-awareness about, you know, what's going on physically, mm -hmm. how, what that outcome of your psychological process is physically. Mm-hmm. Are you thinking your way through that, or are you getting to a point where you're just doing it? I'm getting to a point where I'm just doing it. it, it in fact, the last couple of years have been that. I, I despise mirrors. I don't like to know what I look like. Mm. Um, so I those chunk of years that I was doing things in front of my computer to um, to see if I believed myself, I did that, and then I stopped because I hated looking at myself on a computer because uh, – playing back um, I would be so um, just uh, so horrible to myself like oh look at this and look at that and so finally I was like I can't do it anymore I just have to trust that it's happening because I'm seeing that it's happening the emotional value and I have to not worry about what my face looks like and and, and uh, my assumption is is that you get on the set they they shoot and nobody says to you oh that was 
really awful or that was really something wrong or anything like that. They, they're good with what, what, you, what you're doing. Yeah. Um, when you're working with a very prominent director mm -hmm. like a Richard Linklater, like a Christopher Nolan, mm -hmm. is it a different experience? Um, <laughs> the, that makes me giddy because uh, the callbacks, um, Richard Linklater has days and confused <laughs> when I was in high school <laughs> was like my one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when these really amazing directors come into town, getting the callback is the thing that makes me feel like I won the game. Sure. Because I just want to meet them and not fangirl out, but just say thank you. Um, the the little girl from Southern Ohio wants to say thanks. And so um, uh, meeting Richard and working with Richard, he's so down to earth and he's just such a dude from Texas and he's he's <laughs> awesome. And like you would expect him to be, you know? Um, and it's it's cool because you think like his mind has created some really incredible characters and really incredible stories. Um, so, but I fangirl over people in shows, like uh, people that I've done shows with at the public that um, Judy Blazer, who was in comp I was in company with, mm -hmm. um, I was a big fan of hers. Um, when I was in the latter years of high school, I saw her in shows and I would watch her on stage in New York. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. So when I found out she was going to be in company, I freaked out. And the first day I was like, I'm a fan. And she's like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm a fan. And I have been a fan since I was 17 years old. And it's imp it's important for me to feel that fangirl thing because then I don't ever think I I never get to the point where I'm like I'm really important. It's like no, I'm I'm a fan. Has of that this. happened for you yet? Um, where what where like, somebody comes up or they're in a show and they say they're a fan of yours? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's and how so did, weird. And how did you think about that? Oh, it's so strange and wonderful and. Because I have a sort of a similar thing that goes on for me. I'm which sure. To have, when people figure out what I've done. Yeah. And they come up and they, they start, they actually start shaking and it's like, stop. Yeah. <laughs> it's That's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's a bizarre thing, that phenomenon. But you experienced it from both sides of the fence. Yeah. Where you are a fangirl and then people were a fan of you. It, it has happened before. Well, it's going to happen more for you over time. <laughs> It's it's pretty. Can believe that. Yeah, it's pretty strange. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what is a direction that you've received from any director that you think is a really fantastic direction, mm. or mm. or a series of them. Um, um, let's see. Um, there is a there's an actor in town who is also a director who you know very well, Marty Giles. Yes. Um, I have not done a show under Marty's direction since 2013. Um, we did John Gabriel Borkman at um, Quantum. Mm -hmm. And um, he is my one of my favorite directors I've ever worked with. Okay, so tell us why. He is, um, because he's an actor and because he's a brilliant actor. Yeah, very, very. I mean, he's incredible. And I, when, when I fangirled over him when I was in college because I saw him in a production of Uncle Vanya at Picked and I was like a junior and I waited afterwards for him and I was like, <laughs> hi, my name is this. Um, I am going to make myself the official um, uh, president of your fan club. <laughs> And he was like, okay. <laughs> you know. Did he and, call security? Yeah, right, exactly. And typical Marty Sally was like, all right, cool. You're so strange. But I I had never seen, I mean, Uncle Vanya, I mean, it was like it was so amazing. Um, and I had never seen someone go so fully, like in my life, because I didn't grow up going to see shows. Mm -hmm. So I went to see that play and I was like, that guy, I'm. I am peeking. I am snooping. Oh, he's all in. Oh, God, yes. And I wanted to be just like him. Um, and uh, and will continue to want to be just like him. Mm -hmm. um, so when he, when we started, we've done a handful of shows together that he's directed. And, um, and he, he just, he has this, this outside of the piece 
uh, outside of the play um, way of 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 creating the atmosphere he wants, and it's not necessarily the the easiest way, but it's the way he sees it, and it's the way he wants to create that atmosphere and wants that atmosphere to feel to the audience. And I find it so challenging and fascinating. It- is there is there something that he does that you you absolutely does he start you in the beginning of the rehearsal process and tell you what that is or does he work you into it? Um, he I think he works you into it. Um, I it's uh, and some actors uh, soak it up and other actors push it away. And what do you do if you're working with an actor that's counter to it? Um, uh, I just try to stay open. I just try to keep going the way that that he would want me to 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 go and hope that that actor gets on board I never say anything I never I I think that explains a whole lot about you and Mm. that is that you're malleable very much so you're not stuck in one place you don't come in this is the way I'm doing it everybody get out of my way yeah no 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 no. I assume you've worked with an actor or two have been like that oh yes and what do you do you just do your thing and remain open yeah I I react um I react as honestly as I can in the moment to the same line being said to me every single Mm -hmm. night and um, whatever is in the atmosphere at that point. Do you, I, I'm going to jump to a conclusion. You prefer an actor that's giving back to you more than you're giving to them sometimes, um, or both, or, or and that it's a it's a challenge when you have an actor that's not giving to you. Yes, yes. Um, there, yes. I like when I love when it's it is new and fresh every single night. It is a a, a challenge when somebody when I know exactly what I'm going to be getting because then it's all on me. It's all on me to to live and breathe in this moment, new, um, new feelings, new everything, and um, and in the past couple of years there have been some really amazing actors that um, that I have been so inspired by because it was a tennis match between the two of us. It was literally, I was gathering what they were scattering and they were picking up what I was putting down. That's cool. And it's amazing. And I would come home every night and I'd say to Dan, it's thrilling. It's just fantastic because it's always, it's always right and truthful. And we would, different things would happen and it would have a different quality, but it was always right in the scene that's a chemical process that you can't plan for yeah that's something that's just happening um ge- uh, not generically but happening in that mil- mix yeah it's chemical um so when you're creating a character when you've got you finally have the text you've got the, the part and you're getting ready to do this thing where do you start to create the character? Where do you, what what is your thinking process going into it? I know you've got the text. Do you have a methodology where you say I'm now I'm I'm going to create this character, or does it just happen organically? I think that um, rehearsal. Uh, I love rehearsing, mm-hmm. and I um, reading a play is wonderful, and I get the kind of you know, the nucleus of these are the given circumstances and these are the things that I know. And then hearing, getting into a room and hearing the voices of the other people that I'm talking to um, is, it's it helps so much in um, creating that world. What world are we living in? And then the character can... Um, grow from there. This is the, the this is the tone that I'm responding to, and we're all creating characters together without really talking about it, um, but talking through the character's voice in the scene. This is part and parcel of the you go somewhere and people don't know where you've gone because you're in a you're imagining that world. Yeah, and and that has to come out of the text because. Clearly, if you're doing something that's science fiction, if you're doing The Dark Knight, mm-hmm. that's entirely different from doing The Revolutionists. Totally. T- totally different from doing Jacques Brel. Mm-hmm. They're very different. Mm-hmm. So you are, you just have this ability to see what's the, what is the text of the thing and then to envision what that world is going to be even before you get there. Yeah. I, I, is that the development of the character? Yeah, that's the beginnings of the development. And then it all becomes physical and... And um, senses come into play. Would you say that it's a little bit like misshapen clay till you get into rehearsal, and then the, cl- the the rehearsal actually shapes that clay? Yeah, absolutely. 
It's very misshapen clay before I get into <laughs> rehearsal. Um, it's a real big mess, but um, but it's it, it's just not been um, it's not been focused yet. It's not been refined. How often does it happen to you where you're 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 feeling not disciplined about something, and how do you get disciplined, or does that never happen to you? Mm, I feel like I'm too disciplined. Um, Sometimes, most of the time, all of the time. <laughs> um, because I, my, for instance, this last year, I, I have no social life. I mean, I just, I, because as soon just as. just work. I just work. Um, and that, I'm just like my mother. Uh, my mother was the same way. And so um, I just work all the time. And I am so disciplined that um, it never shuts off. I sometimes wish that I punched a clock and was like, done. You know, and my parents have talked to me about like, you need to leave that stuff at the rehearsal hall, but mm -hmm. that's not the nature of this. That's not who you are. And that's not who I am. Um, so it is, um, it's all consuming. And um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your discipline is not a problem. <gasps> no. Because there are a lot of people that have discipline issues. Oh, sure. I've got plenty of students that have discipline issues. And I had discipline issues when I was in college. So what did you do then? How, uh, did, you, how did you become more disciplined? Um, I Fear? Probably, yeah. Um, um, I didn't want to disappoint. And I, I, I wanted, I, I had disciplinary problem. Not, I wasn't a bad kid by any means, but like getting work done. I mean, I remember a particular... Uh, paper that I was supposed to write for theater history at Point Park and I started it the night before and it was supposed to be this massive thing on um oh god it was some Greek play <laughs> and I ended up this is so ridiculous I ended up making a a Dr. Seuss <laughs> inspired <laughs> book uh and made rhymes and um, made drew the Dr. Seuss characters of a Greek play of a Greek play, <laughs> and I gave it to Kate Aronson. Kate Aronson was my teacher, and um, and I was I think I was a sophomore, and she was like, "This is amazing! I can't grade this. <laughs> you are supposed to give me a twenty-page paper on Agamemnon, and you know it wasn't Agamemnon. I can't remember what it was, but you were supposed to give me a, a paper." And this is really cool, but I can't grade this. And I was like, really? Because in my mind, that was that would suffice for a grade. Like that would. I do would have it. given you a grade, <laughs> like a D. Uh, no, no, I, no. If it if it was really clever and thoughtful, and you did a good job on it, I would give you an A for that. I appreciate that. I I did not get an A. I ended up having to take that class again. But I just <laughs> I did. I had to take it the next year. But I just. I'm not a paper writer. I've no, I despised school from first grade on. And then when I got to Point Park, I loved it because it was like summer camp. Like you're well, going you to grade fun. Oh yeah, you're going to grade me for my emotional construct yeah. in, of this in in school. You're being forced to have fun. At least that's in my mind if you're a theater student or you're a film student, you're being forced to have fun. And when you see students, your fellow students who are not having fun, mm. you think, "What are you doing here?" Yeah. You're just wasting, you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. This is fun. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So, Especially if you didn't grow up doing it. And then you get here and you're like, you guys are so weird. Let's have fun. <laughs> Let's have, exactly <laughs> right. So we have been talking for a little more than an hour, if you can believe that. Wow. And um, w w always the last two questions of Story Beat are, um, you've obviously met and worked with lots of people over time. Um, can you relate to us, from your experiences, any kind of an oddball, quirky, funny, strange, weird story that might be fun to hear? Hmm. Oh, goodness. About another actor? Oh, no. It could be about anything about that's anything. Hap happened to you or that something else that happened. Oh, okay. Or on a set or on a stage. Um, I will. There Two come to mind, but um, the one that... We'll, we'll take both if you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first is dark from Dark Knight Rises. Um, I was I was really excited because I'm a I was a big Batman fan. Of course, I'm fans of all this stuff because mm -hmm. I had infinite amounts of times time when I was young to do whatever. Um, and so, so, so it was just you and the cows. <laughs> it was me and the cows and my cats <laughs> and my parents when they were around. Um, and uh, so I I was really excited. I was doing Antony and Cleopatra at Pitt mm -hmm. when I found out that I was cast. 
and I just couldn't believe it. And uh, when I finally went, to, I had to drop out of a show because it was going to be taking place during filming, and um, and I got to set, and it was four thirty in the morning, and I was in the trailer, and Marion Cotillard is on my left, <laughs> and. Um, uh, Gary Oldman is on my right, <laughs> and Joseph Gordon-Levitt oh, is on dear. his right. And I'm like, I kept thinking over and over, one of these things is not like the other, <laughs> that song from <laughs> Sesame Street, because I'm like, what is, and she's on the phone speaking French. It's 4.30 in the morning, and they're putting this, you know, I'm just, I'm like, what am I doing here? So we get to set, and they were all very nice. Uh, and we get to set, and Gary Oldman, um, <laughs> he we were walking up, I think it was like 40th Street in Lawrenceville or something. It was their first day filming in Pittsburgh. We're walking up 40th. And oh, you were in the first day of their First Pittsburgh. day. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. So they had all just gotten here. And they were in India prior to that, like okay. doing things. So I, I'm walking with Gary Oldman, and all I'm thinking is like, Sid Vicious, Sid Vicious. Like, I'm <laughs> like, so I can't get that. But he's like so nice, and he's so British, and he's so nice. And so we're walking up the street, and he said, uh, Chris and I have been um, calling you Wilma. And I said, why? <laughs> like, where's that come from? And he said, well, um, when I asked who they cast as Matthew's wife, he said, um, this pale, red-headed girl whose last, who, the, the, the last letter in her name is an A. <laughs> And I, he's like, and I immediately thought of Wilma. And I was like, from the Flintstones? <laughs> and he's like, yes. And so the whole time I was on set, when, I, when he took me and introduced me, I mean, he took me to introduce me to Chris, Christopher. And he, I walked up and he said, Wilma! I mean, that was the first thing he said. And I was like, this is so weird. And usually people never say my name right because it's spelled weird. But it was the first time ever that I was like, yep, I'm Wilma. Call me Wilma, whatever you say, because you're Christopher Nolan and Gary Oldman. And they called me Wilma the whole time. Oh, It was... So hysterical. If, so if they saw you today, they'd still call you they Wilma. They would probably call me Wilma. <laughs> I would imagine. And you would be grateful for it, wouldn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what, if, what's the other story? Um, the other story is I was living in New York, and my agent had gotten me this audition. Um, actually, Ted Pappas made me write a whole thing of this before. Ted Pappas, the artistic director at Pittsburgh Public for a long time. Yes. He's um, now recently retired. He's now recently retired, and, um, and he... Uh, he actually cast me in my first play when I was at Point Park, um, George Abbott's Broadway, and mm. it was I had the best time, um, and that created this whole relationship. So they were doing um, Venus and Fur, and they had asked some um, some of us to remember and write down a, a funny audition story because it's about auditioning that show, and um, and. He remembered this story that I told him when I was living in New York. Um, my agent had gotten me a, a, a an audition for this off Broadway show that I was told was about farm animals, <laughs> 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 and that um, and that I they asked me they wanted one song to be sung as a farm animal and then another song to be um, just you singing. And I was fascinated by this, and I was like, oh, my God. So I came up with this whole thing. I love being given a, like, this is what the outcome needs to be. Mm -hmm. Find your way there. Okay. And um, and so I decided I would sing Love Revolution from I Love My Wife because that was my big belty song. And then I would, and that would be my song as a person, as a human. And then I decided that I would sing um, Unusual Way, the last 16 bars of Unusual Way, as a chicken laying an egg. <laughs> <laughs> and so I paper mache an egg that um, I did. It was like a whole week thing. And I papered mache this egg, and I walked. I mean, I lived in Hell's Kitchen, so I was able to just walk to where I was going. Um, and I carried that stupid egg, and I got there, and I sang my first song, and they really liked it. And then I, uh, they asked me for the second song, and I, I got on the ground, and I, they didn't see the egg. I like hid the egg, and it was underneath me. And when I got to the end of, in a very 
can you? <laughs> and I was like, you know, convulsing and doing all kinds of things. And I lifted it up and I wrote, like it was Simba. I said, you made me whole and raised it to the air. And they were cracking up and like clapping. And then the woman was like, that was amazing. This isn't a comedy, though. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, no. Because I thought, of course, a barnyard animal musical has got to be funny. It can't be a dr But it was, like, religious. And I don't even. So I got a call back. <laughs> but I didn't book the show. Did you bring your egg the second time? I, she. They actually said that I could leave it at you home. Leave and the I was like, home. okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was I love like I have so many little stories like that where I've I just um, I go all in and I come up with these weirdo ideas. I think that that's uh, that is the way to think about it, because huh. if you play the middle, it's too safe. It's too safe. Yeah. You got even if it doesn't work, you went all in. Totally. Right? And it makes a great story. So I'm not sure whether that'll be your, also your great piece of advice, but do you have a single piece of advice or a tip that you can give to those who are trying to make their way in the world or try to make their break or to further themselves in a career? Do you have a good piece of advice? Yeah. Um, be yourself. Don't question yourself. Be true to you. Um, as soon as you start doubting what, what you think is right or acceptable or um, just be you and it will be picked up on. It's a really hard, um, it's a hard life and it's a hard career and you're constantly told no and it's not based on you and your character. It's based on the costume that needs to be filled or the, um, the person that they're, they're trying to fill in this part as um, they need for that person to be taller because the guy is taller. I mean, there's all these things that are not in our control. And as soon as you accept that and know that you're worth something, you are worth a lot and and you love yourself, um, you get out of your own way. Because I feel like it comes into the room if you are a nervous wreck um, and desperate for the job. And if you just come in and say, this is me, and then leave there and and um, not play it over a million times in your head. When they call and give you the call back, it's all the, the more sweeter. It's, I think that's a very valuable piece of advice. Just be you. Yeah. Because after all, that's what you're. That's the again. That's the temple that you're bringing people into. Is is you? Yeah. Totally. Wonderful. Well, Dana, this has just been one of my favorite episodes. Oh, this yay. This has been terrific. <laughs> Lots of great information. I loved your your uh, Dark Knight Rises story. That's just fantastic. <laughs> so thank you for coming today. Totally. Thank you for having me. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.